Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I am here for my LPL 2024 Spring Split Playoff Primer video. I'm very excited to get into this. Obviously, the LPL regular season is done. Every single team has gone through the single round robin, and the top 10 are remaining, and we are getting into the series that really matter now. You know, best of threes are done, best of fives are in. Every single team needs to step up from this point onwards because only two can go to MSI, and only one can be the L. PL champion coming out of the spring split. So a lot to talk about in today's video. I'm very excited for it. I hope you guys are as well. If you are, let me know down in the comments section below. How do you feel about the playoffs for the LPL right now? What teams do you think are going to do well? What teams do you think might underperform some of their seedings and rankings? Of course, I will be giving my opinions throughout this video on everything in the playoffs. But if you want to know my thoughts on every single week of LPL action, we have covered every single week in terms of a weekly review on this channel. You can check out the playlist up in the iCard right now if you're interested in my thoughts and analysis on all of those weeks, but we're going to give kind of a condensed version for these teams today. I'm very excited to go over it, and I don't want to waste too much of you guys' time, so let's jump right into the video. Of course, if you are new here, essentially what we are going to be doing is going through quite a few things, starting off with my award picks for the regular season. We are going to be talking about the major awards as well as the all-pro teams, and so I'll kind of give you an overview of how I felt about all of these players. Spoiler alert, there are going to be some controversial, some hot takes in the uh, all pro selections in particular, but uh, we're going to talk about those and kind of wrap up the regular season there. And then we will move on to talking about the teams that are in the playoffs. I'll be giving an in-depth breakdown of kind of the play style and expectations for the top six teams. And of course, the bottom four teams, we're going to be talking about them in the lens of their round one matchup, because it doesn't really matter how the team plays in general. It matters how they specifically play into their matchup, because if they can't win round one, then the rest of it doesn't matter. You're not in, uh, you're not in a double elimination bracket at this stage. And so you need to be able to beat the team that is across from you. Of course, at the end, once we talk about all the teams, I'm also going to be giving my full bracket prediction for the LPL playoffs, predicting where teams are going to finish, what teams might win or lose series they are either expected or not expected to win, and we're going to be going over it there, but I'm excited to get into it. I don't want to waste too much time on this intro because there is a lot to cover in the LPL playoffs, especially in comparison to basically every other region. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Of course, like I said before, we are going to be starting off with our major award awards here, and there are no awards more major than the MVP award. You know, there's two individual awards that I will be giving out, but most valuable player is definitely the one that I think most people are interested. This was kind of a difficult decision for me, but really at the end of the day, it wasn't all that difficult. And anybody who's followed my weekly review kind of series definitely knows where I'm going to be going with this. But my choice for the 2024 spring split MVP here in the LPL is going to be Knight, the mid laner for Billy Billy Gaming. I don't think this is a particularly difficult decision to make. He was excellent across this split for the best team in the entire league. Now, I do want to go over my criteria at least a little bit here at the start. I'm going to reiterate this at the start of all pros because I think that's also a place where it is entirely relevant, but I value consistency pretty highly in terms of, I don't like bad games. Bad games are definitely going to detract to you in terms of how I rank, you know, all pros and, and MVP voting and individual awards and things like that, even if it doesn't make me view you entirely different as an individual player. But I think it's fair to quantify the system I use to determine my award winners and the players that I think had, you know, better regular seasons by asking the question, who do I think added more wins to their individual team? And for me, nobody added more wins to their team this year than Knight, whether that was as a carry or as a facilitator. He could do it all. And he's been this guy for a lot of years. You know, I've been really high on Knight. I got a lot of flack in the offseason for a couple of things. First of all, putting Chovy as my A-plus player, my number one player in the LCK. People were not happy about that. He was pretty unique unanimously the MVP of the regular season and Knight being, in my opinion, the best player in the LPL and saying that, you know, I think JDG might not be as successful without him and BLG, I think, is gaining a player that's really going to unlock this team a lot. I had BLG number one in my power rankings going into the year and that's how it's played out so far in the regular season. Knight, to me, has been clearly the best player in the LPL once again and it's really because of just how versatile he is. Again, he makes everybody around him better because he's winning so frequently. This is what we're seeing a lot around the world with really good mid laners is that when you are able to generate a lot of pressure and prio in the mid lane on your own, isolated 1v1 without jungle assistance, all of a sudden you can translate that into getting your jungler super ahead or getting your bot lane or your top lane super ahead, depending on where you want to put your resources. Objectives become a lot easier. The game just kind of be 
becomes a lot easier to win when you've got a mid laner that is winning and is strong. And so credit tonight, I thought he was exceptional. Of course, he can play carries. He can play things like the RE, you know, more assassin oriented. He's got like a 90 something percent career win percentage on that champion. He's the best RE in the world. You know, I love Faker, but right now it's Knight who's the best RE in the world. And then he can play Karma. He can play Nico. He can play Talia. He can play, you know, assassins. He's still really good in that style. He can do really whatever you need him to do. And he fits really well with the rest of this roster. Billy Billy was number one in the regular season for a reason. And to me, that is almost, I'm not going to say entirely because of Knight, because we'll talk about how good a lot of the other players on this team played. But I think Knight was definitely the primary factor, in my opinion. The runners up, the honorable mentions, my second place MVP vote is going to go to Kanavi, the jungler for JD Gaming. That team really had some up and downs throughout this year. I don't think they, you know, expected to not be a top two seed going into playoffs, which we'll obviously talk about. But you cannot fault Kanavi for that. He was winning a majority of their series for them. There were times where Ruler and Missing were just not the consistent force that you would expect. Yagao, I think, definitely wasn't nearly as good as he was the last time that he played with Kanavi. And, you know, I think top lane's been both good and bad at times throughout the year. But Kanavi's been the constant for this team, consistently getting them leads and advantages. And once again, I think his value is honestly going a little bit under the radar. I think a lot of people aren't as high on him as I am, but to me, he is clearly the best player on JDG, and he's clearly the reason that this team is starting to, you know, find its form towards the back half of the split. Of course, you would have liked things to be a little bit more clean in this regular season, but you really cannot blame the jungle for that. Kanavi was excellent, a great follow-up to last year for him. And then my third place, Milky Way. Yes, absolutely. He deserves to be in this conversation. Whether or not you think as a player, he's going to be able to, su to sustain this, I think that's Definitely a valid question at this point in his career because of his play style and because of the way that he was brought up through the system. I think these are fair, you know, questions to ask, but what is not fair is to say that he didn't add a ridiculous amount of wins to FPX throughout this year. He was the guy for FPX, a team that finished in the top four. Most people, me included, predicted them to be in like the bottom four teams in the league this year. And Milky Way comes in as a rookie and, you know, brings them into the upper echelon of teams in the LPL, especially if this team continues to go on a run. If Milky Way continues to be a primary focal point. You know, we're going to really start looking at him as the future of the LPL, but at least for now, it is undeniable the impact that he had on this individual team. There are going to be people that give him, you know, MVP because there is an argument to be made that of all of the players on all of the teams, he is the most valuable to his individual team in terms of raising them up. And honestly, I can see that. I just think Knight and Kanavi were a little bit better in terms of their performances this year, which is why they rank above him for me. But again, Milky Way was excellent and he absolutely deserves an MVP vote. Just just for me, that's going to be third place. So Milky Way in third place, Kanavi in second place, and Knight is going to get my first place MVP vote. But that's the first major reward. It's time to move in to the second, which is, of course, Rookie of the Split. Broadcast doesn't give this out anymore. They do Rookie of the Year as a whole. And I totally understand why, but I do want to acknowledge some of the great rookies that played here in spring and talk about where I think they could be going for the rest of the year. So my Rookie of the Split in 2024, spring for the LPL, Come on, man. There's no shock here. It's Milky Way. We just talked about him. The jungler for fun plus Phoenix. Really, if you're getting MVP votes as a rookie, you're probably going to be rookie of the split. It really is not that complicated. He was by far the most valuable rookie in the entire league. We'll talk about the honorable mentions a bit more because we've already spent some time here on Milky Way, but this is not really a particularly difficult debate. He was the most impactful rookie in the entire league, arguably the most impactful player towards his team's success in the entire league. And all of this without even being the official star in their opening series. It's just incredibly impressive. Nobody really knew what we were going to get out of Milky Way. I was really high on him. Maybe not really high, but I was certainly high on him going into the year. I thought he was better than Moyan, who was slated to start above him. I said as much in my, you know, preseason power rankings video for FPX, but even I, like who was higher on him, could have never in a million years imagined that he was going to have the kind of split that he had. I'm just really excited to see a player that I think a lot of people didn't really know whether or not he was going to be too feast or famine come into the league and be like, no, I'm a carry. I can explode games open in the early game and just kind of snowball them out of control and nobody's going to be able to stop me in those situations. He was incredible. My honorable mentions, my runners up, my second place vote is going to Zhao Feng, the jungler for OMG. He was very important to what OMG wanted to do across this year. Him and Angel were really the focal points, and we'll talk about that a bit more when we get into OMG in the later part of this video. But I think without Zhao Feng, without Angel, like they don't make playoffs. They're not even remotely close to a playoff team. And so you got to give him a lot of credit for that. I thought his early games were very consistent. And he was actually pretty good at being able to close down on leads. Obviously, a lot of that helps when you have very good synergy with your mid lane. But in a league where, 
where, you know, rookie junglers are not always the most successful. See this split already for quite a few other players, like at EDG and RA, really struggling to try to get their rookie junglers off the ground. Having a player like Zhao Fang be as consistent and, quite frankly, as much of a positive as he was across this year was very integral in OMG, over exceeding or at least hitting their expectations in the preseason. And then Sheer is going to get my third place vote. I know he barely played any games. I know he played less than half of the split. But to me, he was the third best rookie in the league. Whether you want to say that that's fair or that he shouldn't qualify for the award, I think that's really up to whether you whether or not you personally you know believe in a game restriction or anything like that. But uh, Sheer was, in my estimation, the player who added the third most amount of wins of any rookie in the entire league. Uh, there just isn't a very deep pool to choose from for rookies that actually did a lot of good for their team rather than negative stuff for their team across this split. And Sheer, I think, definitely was a huge positive. In fact, we'll talk about him a bit later when it comes to JD Gaming. Their upside is a lot higher now that he is in the lineup over Flandre. And I like Flandre. This guy, you know, Flandre's won Worlds. We know what he can do at his absolute best, but Sheer is just kind of a game breaker, and we've already seen it against some really good top laners. You know, you don't just... You're not just a rookie who comes into the lineup and beats 369 in lane twice in a row and it just gets overlooked, right? Like, that's a very, very impressive thing to do. And this guy could be elite moving forward, especially if he's given the full reins on JDG. But because he played so little games, he's only going to get third in my voting. Zhao Fang is going to get second and Milky Way is going to get first as my rookie of the split again to no one's real surprise. But then moving on now from our major awards into our all pro teams for the spring split here in 2024 in the LPL. These are, of course, the same criteria that I listed for MVP. I am kind of taking this based off of the idea of who do I think added the most amount of value to their team? Who do I think added the most amount of wins to their team? So you're not just going to see a bunch of players from, you know, the best teams in the league scattered throughout the all pros. I'm going to be including some players from other teams that I really think propped those other teams up, perhaps more than other players did on lower tier teams. That being said, this is still almost entirely the best teams in the league because when you are playing well, you win. That's kind of how League of Legends works. And so the players who played really well ended up winning a lot of games. But we're going to go all pro team by all pro team here, of course, starting with my first team all pro, which is up on the screen now. I'm going to be going over every single player in these all pros. You know, we've already talked about a couple of them, but we will be going in depth on why I chose them for the all pro in these sections and why, you know, once we get to third team, I I maybe left some people off of this list. And again, there are going to be some that, you know, especially already on the screen here that you might not agree with or you might not always, you know, uh, think is correct. I would love to hear from you guys down in the comment section below as long as the conversation is more, you know, uh, polite and not, you know, I can't believe you would put this. Clearly, you didn't watch the games, yada, yada, yada. You know, obviously, I watched the games. I did a weekly review. And so, you know, if you want to have that conversation, I'm not saying that my way is the only correct way. These are just my personal opinions. But let's go ahead and go over what those opinions are and kind of give some reasoning as to why I may have selected a couple of them. So let's jump right into it. As you can see, my first team all pro for the spring split is 369 from Top Esports in the top lane, Kanavi from JD Gaming in the jungle, Knight from Billy Billy Gaming in the mid lane, Elk from Billy Billy Gaming in the bot lane, and Mako from Top Esports in the support position. Obviously, this is a very interesting and, you know, kind of team diverse list here. You've got the top three teams represented. I think that's relatively fair, and I think all of these players did add a ridiculous amount of value to their teams. They were the focal points for a lot of what these teams wanted to do, but I do think you have some conversations to be had, and we'll get to that a bit more as we go throughout the rest of these lists, because we're going to talk about the players that could have been on first team, probably in second team. So, you know, we'll talk about it, but as for the players who are on first team, we'll kind of go position by position talking about why I personally think they were the best individual players in their role, starting with 369 in the top lane. This was not a particularly difficult decision for me to make. In my opinion, he was clear cut the most important top laner to his team's success in 2024 so far. Top Esports really invested a lot into their offseason roster. They went out and picked up a bunch of big names to try to surround the core that they really liked here in Tion and Jackie Love and man, did it work out. Two of the players that they went and picked up this offseason are on this first team all pro list, but 369, you could argue, was the most important of them. I think it's definitely a conversation, but in terms of top laners, there just weren't a lot of players that were winning lane as consistently as 369 was and were translating it into team fight success as much as 369 was. Obviously, he's known a bit more as a, you know, safe top lane player, especially after last year on JD Gaming when you have this super team, you have all these resources going towards the bottom side of the map with Knight and Ruler, of course, being primary carries on that team. 369 was often left in low 
resource situations because of it, but he is a high resource player when you go back to the history of his career, when you go back to his first run on Top Esports, when you go back to his first year on JD Gaming before the Super Team. This is a guy who has been trusted to be a primary carry at a super high top lane level for the best teams in the world, and he can clearly still do that. To me, this was not even much of a conversation. He was the best top laner in the LPL. And then Kanavi, we've already talked about a bit. He was my runner-up to the MVP here. Uh, really not a lot else to say. He was by far the most important person to JD Gaming, in my opinion, for the second year in a row. That was my bold take last year, was that Kanavi was the most important player to JDG in terms of their success in 2023. I think that's carried over into 2024. When he wins in the jungle, they win games instantly. And even when he loses, he's able to fight himself back into team fighting situations a lot of the time, more so than a lot of the other junglers. Yes, he is kind of the king of the early game. That's how I would describe Kanavi. The big reason why I think he's so dominant as a jungler in terms of the grand scheme of things is because I do feel like there just aren't a lot of junglers out there that can keep up with him in terms of his early game pace and pathing and he's able to close games out very quickly because of that but it's not like he's bad in the mid to late game either even from behind he's just one of the most complete players regardless of position in the entire world and he once again was a driving force for what JDG wanted to do Knight again another player I've already talked about at length I'm not going to go into too much detail here but the most valuable player on the most valuable team in the entire league he has completely reinvigorated Billy Billy playing through him, playing through someone else with him as a facilitator, him just winning lame by 30 CS no matter who he's playing or who he's playing against. It's ridiculous. He is the most talented player in the LPL in terms of mechanics and in terms of individual skill level and that has come through very clearly in, in how he has turned around Billy Billy Gaming. Not that they were bad at all last year. They were obviously still very good. They finished with the same record in the regular season this year as they did last year but this team's upside has gone through the roof and the expectations have gone through the roof and a lot of that is through night, so you got to give him credit. And then Elk, his teammate down in the bot lane, to me, it was also clear that he was the best AD carry in the LPL this split. This was another one that I really wasn't thinking all that much about because Elk was the most dominant AD carry. He was winning laning phases. He was beating his competition in the one series that he did have against, you know, JD Gaming's bot lane, which I think a lot of people would consider the second best bot lane in the league. He destroyed them. Elk was by far the best player in that series, and it wasn't particularly close. He had a phenomenal split, really kind of came off of last year and improved on some of the things that he was doing. Doing well. I think this was more of a continuation in a lot of ways to what he was showing last year, a general uptick in the expected way for Elk, but he has become one of the world's best AD carries, and that was very clear in 2024. And then Mako, I think some people are going to be surprised not to see on here. We'll get to him in a little bit. I think support was probably the hardest to choose from in terms of the first team, because I think there are two phenomenal choices that both played excellent. If you want the full Billy Billy Gaming bot lane here on first team, I totally understand. I'm not going to give you any pushback on that. I think that's a fair very respectable thing to put here, but honestly, Mako was the best player on Top Esports. In my opinion, I think he added the most amount of wins to that team, and for me, Top Esports was the second best bot lane in the LPL this year, only behind Billy Billy Gaming, and Mako was a huge part of why that was the case, and so I wanted to give him a lot of credit, and to me, he was more deserving slightly of that first team All-Pro. Again, if you wanted to go a different direction, I would understand, but these, to me, were the five best players in their individual roles. I think they were the five players who impacted the game the most from their individual positions, and the only one I really thought too hard about was support, but that transitions nicely into my second team All-Pro, which is, of course, up on the screen now. We'll go ahead and go in order again. In the top lane, it's going to be Wayward from Team WE. In the jungle, it's going to be Milky Way from Fun plus Phoenix. In the mid lane, it's going to be Rookie from Ninjas in Pajamas. In the bot lane, it's Ruler from JD Gaming. And in the support position, it's On from Billy Billy Gaming. Some controversial picks are going to start here, specifically in the top lane with Wayward. Say what you want about him. Did he receive a lot of resources from his team this year? Yes. Was he funneled in a lot of different games? Absolutely. Could you have gotten a lot of other top laners to do this job? Honestly, probably. There are quite a few top laners that I think could have done what Wayward did with the resources this year, but at the same time, can you point to five or six series across this year of WE's eight winning series that Wayward actively won because of the resources that were given to him? Yes, like say what you will about whether or not you think Wayward as a player deserves to be considered in the top five even of top laners in the LPL, but in terms of the production and the amount of wins actively that he added to the team this year, I just don't think there is a lot of debate. He was the focal point and driving force for a team that was at times very, very successful throughout this year. Just because this team has fallen off in recent memory doesn't mean those games earlier in the season count for less. Remember, this is a full regular season award. This isn't just the final five weeks or anything like that, and there was 
a, a strong stretch through the first four or five weeks of the split where Wayward was the best top laner in terms of production in the LPL. Now, he did fall off down the stretch, which is why he falls here to second team, even though he does have the most player of the series of any top laner in the LPL in terms of migrating metrics. He still is somebody that has to be recognized as having a very important split for WE. They do not make playoffs if they don't run their offense through him. There's really no other way to say it. He was the driving force for them in the beginning part of the split when players like Prince and Fofo, you know, they were playing okay. You know, Fofo was playing pretty well, but Hang was really struggling. Prince was really struggling. Iwandi was really struggling. Wayward was playing excellent and, you know, really got them to 500. So to me, a pretty, you know, concrete choice here for second team, even if it's certainly not going to be popular, I expect. And then Milky Way in the jungle, again, already went over him in multiple different segments, was Fun Plus Phoenix for a lot of this year. He certainly wasn't the only player that I thought played well. We'll talk about that a bit more when we get into third team, which I know is going to surprise some people, but certainly the player that I think had the biggest impact, and as an MVP finalist, a, a top three in MVP voting for me, the only reason he falls into second team is because another player that was above him in MVP voting is in his same role in Kanavi in the first team. And then Rookie, I feel like Rookie had a very under-the-radar phenomenal split for Ninjas in Pajamas. This team was consistently very very good throughout the split. I know that there is a lot of talk about whether or not they're going to be able to translate that into the playoffs because their weak links have been pretty clear, but Rookie is not one of those weak links. This was a phenomenal bounce back year after what was a down year last year in top esports. He clearly felt more motivated coming back here to NIP. He made the decision to come back to this org before he knew basically any of the players that he was going to be playing with. That's how much he trusted and wanted to play for this organization. And so, you know, it's good to see that reward and that trust get outputted here in the spring split where I think he had a really, really great split. And then Ruler is going to be my AD carry. You know, there were times where I actually considered putting him lower on this list because there were a lot of inconsistent games from him that were pretty out of character in terms of what he has offered over the past couple of years. However, there's just no way you can deny that Ruler was the second most valuable ADC. JDG still played a lot of their games through him. And even though in some important situations, he actually didn't step up to the plate and wasn't quite as dominant, that's in comparison to like the Ruler that we've come to know, which is the best AD carry in the world. He wasn't the best AD carry in the world in this split. I don't think anybody's going to really argue argue that in terms of performance, but he was still pretty darn close. And if this is a down split for Ruler getting second team all pro, it's genuinely ridiculous how good he is. And then on the one player that I think you have a real argument to be made that he is on the first team, you know, him versus Mako, to me, it's close to a 50-50. Whoever you think added more value to their team, I think is generally fair on. I think lost more value in terms of some of the bad plays that he made. Mako didn't really have as many inconsistent games as I think On did across this split, but On's games at his best were probably better. And so it's just wherever you really Really want to draw that line. But On was excellent. I think he was definitely benefited from having a mid laner that was constantly winning, a jungler who was constantly in a good spot, and an AD carry that I considered to be the best in the entire league. But, you know, a lot of those situations were available because of how good On was. It's really, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg kind of situation. On is still a first team all pro caliber player. There were just two really good supports, and I feel bad for dropping him here, but it's just how it's got to be sometimes. And so that's my second team. Again, it was, you know, some controversial picks, and I think that's going to carry over here into my third team all pro which is also going to have a couple of controversial picks from some non-top teams so let's talk about it my third team all pro is looking like bin from billy billy gaming in the top lane tion from top esports in the jungle angel from omg in the mid lane gala from lng esports in the bot lane and life from fun plus phoenix in the support position again some controversial picks we will get to them but top to support we're going we're starting with bin you know i think it's not going to be common to see anybody over bin on second team i think 369 is pretty much locked in a first team all pro nod. I think a lot of people are just going to default give it to him because he kind of was the best top laner in the LPL this year so far. But Bin is going to get second team because he still was good and he has that pedigree. He has that reputation. He continued it throughout the entire year. He was on the best team in the league. There's a lot of reasons that I think Bin is just going to default get that second team all pro. But I don't think Bin added more wins individually in terms of his performances than someone like Wayward did to a worse team over the course of this year. Bin was still excellent and all pro is certainly not something to scoff at, especially Especially here in the LPL when there are 17 teams like it's harder to get into the all pro in this region than it is in any other region just because there are more players more opportunities for other players to come and impress so all pro is certainly not a downgrade in any way I, I think third team all pro is still very prestigious but I think some people are going to look at this as disrespect I still think Ben is one of the best top laners in the world if not the best top laner in the world that's what I ranked him as going into the year and that got a lot of hate because of the Zeus and T1 fans out there but Ben is still excellent he's still a major asset to this team there were just a few 
too, too many games where it felt like he wasn't as mentally locked in as some other players for my liking. Tion is actually also going to get my third team All-Pro nod. This was torture to try and figure out. Oh, also, I didn't give an honorable mention for the top lane, but there really aren't honorable mentions. The top three felt pretty obvious to me. Maybe Ale? Like, he was on a miserably awful team, but he was so far, you know, better than everybody else that he played against and played with that it was very noticeable, but maybe someone like Fondre or Sheer, if you, if you don't really care about the small sample size. To me, these were the top three top laners. No real honorable mentions to give in terms of players that I genuinely would have put on this list, but for Jungle, there absolutely is, because this third team All-Pro is something I sat on for for a long time trying to figure out, do I want to go Tian or do I want to go Jun? It feels really weird to not put Jun on the All-Pro list because he was so good this split and he was so valuable for Billy Billy Gaming for a lot of this split, but honestly, do I think if you took Jun off of Billy Billy and replaced him with a league average player, do I think you would lose more wins than if you took Tian off of Top Esports with an average player? I don't. I think I think Top Esports suffers more in that situation, which is why I'm giving Tion the nod here. I think he's just so much more valuable than people give him credit for. You constantly hear Tion slander online because LPL fans historically, and I say this on the channel all the time, love to scapegoat junglers. It's just something that is very common in terms of the perception of the LPL, the fan base of the LPL. When a team is not doing well, it's often, let's point and laugh at the jungler, let's blame the jungler. I'm not a part of that. I think Tion has kind of gotten a bad reputation for that pretty unjustifiably, in my opinion, but he was awesome this split. For the most part, he was actively winning most of their games on his own. You know, 369 and Mako were doing a lot of the heavy lifting as well, but especially in big, important games against top-tier teams, Tion played excellent this split. So whether you want Tion here or Shun here, I think both are relatively fair. I just, again, think that Shun had a better team around him, which honestly kind of knocks him in terms of my all-pro voting here. Uh, Angel's going to get the nod in the mid lane for my third team. This is another one that I think is pretty clear-cut for me. Angel's a very good player, and there weren't a lot of mid laners that I thought were exceptionally consistent. Like, you can look at a player like Cream and say that Cream had a really good split. I think that down the stretch, Cream was very good. Shanks was phenomenal at the start of the split, but then you look at the final three weeks, and he was awful, like truly miserable, which kind of played his way out of All-Pro, and especially with AL missing playoffs, that doesn't help. UCAL was good, but his team was a disaster, and he really wasn't winning games for his team. He was just playing well individually. OMG is nothing without Angel. I mean, truly, like, he was the carry and the focal point for that team. They feel so much like Ninjas in Pajamas of last year, where it really feels like Angel plus the jungler that he has really good synergy with are taking over, and without them, they would just not be a, even remotely a playoff team. I get that they were only 500, but Angel is the reason that they were 500. To me, that's the third most valuable mid laner in the league. Gala's gonna get the AD carry nod here for third team. You know, again, kind of a difficult decision because I do think that, you know, Fodic was the other player that I was considering here, and Fodic had a real career breakout. I've been hyping him up all year long, which is funny for me because I've been a Fodic hater the entirety of my time here on YouTube, the entirety of the time I've been covering the LPL on this channel in 2022. I really pushed back on the hype that he had on Victory 5 because it felt like Rookie and PP God were really creating a lot of the advantages that he was getting. He didn't really have to do much, was just kind of being gift-wrapped a lot of good plays, and I didn't necessarily think that he was mechanically as good as people were hyping him up to be, and then that proved true, where he was one of the least valuable players in the entire league last year, but was awesome this year. All that to say, he doesn't make my all-pro list. Gala does, because again, he's just so consistent. Like, it's hard not to watch Gala play and say, I would want him on any team that I ever make, right? He, You can put anybody on a team with Gala, and they're going to be better because Gala is there, because he just wins lane or goes even at absolute worst in miserable matchups and is one of the best mid-game skirmishing AD carries in the world, one of the best team fighting AD carries in the world. Maybe he's not the best at any of these stages. He's not the most aggressive. He's not the best team fighter, you know. He's not the single best at everything, but he is the perfect example of jack of all trades. You know, very, very great at all of them. He's not a master of any of them, but he really is like very, very good at everything. And that makes him super valuable. And, and when LNG was struggling this year, he was still very consistent. So he's going to get my all pro nod in the bot lane. And then life. This one's certainly going to be controversial because people are still remembering a lot of life from last year where he was miserable for Hanwha Life Esports. And I'm certainly not going to deny that he was bad for them. But how can you not watch life this year and not see one of the most impactful supports in the entire league. Maybe it's the draft picks. Like, yeah, he played a lot of Rumble this split, and once they started banning Rumble, you know, he wasn't quite the game breaker that he was on that champion, but he was still really good. Like, his Nautilus, his Alistair, they were still really impressive. I think now that a team that he is on is realizing that he shouldn't just be put on Enchanter duty every game that he's not particularly good at. He's starting to play these playmakers, these engagers again, and it's really working for him. So to me, another clear-cut choice here in the support position for the third and final All-Pro team, but there is going to probably be some controversy because he just wasn't very good last year 
Tierney came into the league with the reputation of quote unquote not being very good. I think if you watch the gameplay though, he was incredibly important towards what FPX was doing. But those are my all pro teams. I know there's going to be some controversial hot takes, if you will, in there. Some picks that I don't think a lot of other people are going to be taking. I would love to know your thoughts and opinions on those picks down below. Again, I would just really appreciate it if it was in a more, you know, conversational manner rather than just yelling that I'm stupid and dumb for having this opinion. I promise this opinion is coming from somewhere and I know your opinion is coming from somewhere as well. It doesn't mean either of us are more right or more wrong. We'd love to have that conversation down below, but those are my awards. That's going to be the end of the regular season conversation for this video. It's now time to jump in to the actual playoff preview. But now that we've got our awards out of the way, it's time to get into the actual playoff analysis here. And that is, of course, going to start with the teams that do have buys. Now, in the LPL, it's going to be a lot of the teams. Most of the teams in the playoffs are going to have a buy in round one. Six of the ten do not play in the first round. Of course, it will progress as we go along. Two teams added each round until we get to our you know, final four who get a double elimination bracket. So it is you know pretty beneficial to be one of the upper teams in the regular season. And we're going to start from the top and work our way down to the bottom and that means starting with our number one seed the number one team in the regular season in terms of record it's going to be the 15 and 1 billy billy gaming as the number one seed in the first you know, team we talk about here in this playoff primer video they are the number one seed for a reason that is the cleanest way that i can say this I think you can already kind of see that with the fact that I put four of the five members of this team in all pros. And honestly, it really is all five because June is really like 3.5 in terms of the all pro team. Whether you want him or Tian on the team, I think is really up to personal preference. Again, I, you know, I talked about that in that segment, but they're both really great players and they both had great splits. I just really, really like how Billy Billy is, you know, connected as a team. I like how they play through each other. I like their play style. I like how they found the synergy in their play styles together. Really, I think everything is just kind of working for them. Some of that does bleed through in the stats, but I think it's even better than the stats would suggest, which is crazy because the stats are really that good. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Their lineup is, of course, looking like Bin in the top lane, Shun in the jungle, Knight in the mid lane, Elk at 80 carry, and on at support. It's just star after star after star on this team. I didn't really know what was going to happen when you got a guy like Knight and you put him into this lineup with a bunch of very aggressive players like Bin and like Elk that have been used to getting resources for this team. A lot of people talked about how Yagal was a perfect perfect fit for what Billy Billy wanted to do last year because he is such a low resource mid laner. He doesn't really need to get a lot of attention in the mid lane to win 1v1 to shove and roam and apply pressure alongside his jungler wherever you really needed it on the map. Knight definitely a little bit more resource heavy in terms of his, you know, traditional play style, the way he's historically played at an LPL level. However, you plug and play him into this team. Well, it turns out actually Shun and Bin and Elk and On and all these really aggressive players, they're pretty good at taking a backseat as well. And it really creates this situation where when you're playing against BLG, you really have no idea what they want to do until the draft is over. You really have no way to prep against them because they can draft any sort of style. They can draft any sort of champion in almost any single role. All of these players are so versatile in terms of, you know, at least how they want to play the game with with or without resources that there really is no way to consistently shut them down. Bin might be the most mechanically talented top laner in the world, whether you want to think he's the most consistent or not. I certainly think I would want to play him the least in a big situation, and I think even more unfortunately for a lot of the teams that go up against him, he really steps it up in the playoffs. Historically speaking, he's actually taken some regular seasons off in terms of aggression and really, you know, kind of effort <laughs> in the past, but in the playoffs, he has been an absolute dynamo for every single team that he has played for in BLG has been absolutely no exception to that. You know, he was excellent for this team last year. And then you've got June in the jungle. Like, talk about a playoff hero for this team last year. He was excellent in the best of five stage. Now, he's developed a lot, I would say, as the year has gone on. He was a player that went into the year for me as, I don't want to say the weak link of this team, but the player that I was the least confident was going to continue their world-class performance. He has absolutely kept it up. And I think what's most important for me is that he's developed into a really good facilitator. Obviously, you're still seeing a lot of Xin Zhao, a lot of Kindred, a lot of Lee Sim. You're going to see carry picks. Nidalee is obviously the signature thing for him as a player but you want to see Sejuani, you want to see Maokai, he can pull that off at a high level too. It's not just the flashy picks that he's really good at, and I think that was more exemplified this year. I feel better about Shun going into the playoffs this year than I did last year, and they were awesome last year. Like, this team was great, and he was great as a player last year. There's really nothing else I can say about Knight that I haven't already said. He's the best player in the LPL until proven otherwise right now, and really in any mid lane matchup, he is likely going to be favored. He wins in terms of CS every matchup. He wins in terms of pressure every matchup. It doesn't 
doesn't even really matter if he gets counterpicked. He's just that consistent. And yes, he can play facilitators. He's 6-1 and one on Karma. Hell, he's even 7-0 and oh on the Nico. I know people consider that more of a carry pick, but in terms of the way he plays it, he's oftentimes moving around the map and playing for skirmishes in the early game with that ultimate as soon as he hits level 6. And so... You got to give him credit there. Whether you like him or not, he is, you know, really proven his worth, I would say, over the course of this split. Uh, and then Elk and On are the most aggressive bot lane in the world. They are the one that are going to push the tempo the absolute most. And to go up against them, you have to be able to handle them mechanically. And there are just not a lot of players in the world that can even, you know, reach that bar in the first place. Like maybe JD Gaming, maybe Top Esports bot lane, they can kind of match them in terms of mechanics. But then you have to face the fact that they can play multiple different styles. They can play four Elk in the bot lane in terms of something like Illusion and try to find skirmishes on the bottom side of the map in the mid-game. You can allow On to play something like the Rakan and move around the map and be super versatile in the way that they want to play macro games here, or you can do something in the middle. You can perhaps put Elk on like a Smolder or a Scaling Pick and allow him to just kind of gather resources and be a big team fight threat. They can do everything, and they can really focus on either player, or they can not focus on either of them. It's truly incredible how versatile and scary it is to try and play into Billy Billy. Again, it kind of comes through on the stats, first in first tower percentage, first in dragon percentage, you know, they're very good at being able to pressure bot lane, but second and first blood percentage as well in the entire league. You know, fifth in game duration, I think, is good, but it the control that they have, I think, is exemplified by their tape. Whether or not you want to see that coming through in the stats, and, you know, maybe the CS leads aren't as dominant as they are for some of the other teams. These players play together at an incredibly high level, and honestly, they are absolute favorites going into the playoffs. I had them at number one in my preseason power rankings, and they have not moved from that since then. It's just really hard to see any team consistent Consistently being able to go up against BLG, they are going to be the favorites to win the LPL this year, and they've deserved it so far with the uh, regular season that they've had. Then moving on to our number two seed and the team that obviously is in the same priority bracket as Billy Billy with uh, a guaranteed spot in the double elimination stage. Of course, only the top two teams end up guaranteeing that. It is going to be the 13-3 and three top esports. And I don't think a lot of people expected them to be one of the top two teams coming out of the regular season. They were always seen as the clear number three for a lot of people. And, you know, I think I still kind of feel that way. I'm not going to spoil where I go with my bracket, but I certainly don't feel entirely confident that TES is going to live up to this number two seed, but the fact that they've gotten here, the fact that they were able to be consistent enough to get this spot, I think is to their credit. They have done a lot of really good things over the course of this split. That is shown off by the All-Pro nominations that they got. Two first-team All-Pro nominations for a team that I consider third best in the league. That's pretty darn good. That's a pretty darn good performance that's pretty hard to criticize. Of course, we'll go over it now. Their lineup is looking like 369 in the top lane. Tion in the jungle. Cream in the mid lane. Jackie Love at 80 carry. And Mako at support. Of course, a lot of really good moments from all five of these players. There really isn't a designated weakness, at least in terms of how things have gone so far in 2024. You could potentially project out this team to have a couple of weaknesses, but the strengths we've already outlined. 369 has been the strongest top laner in the LPL, and I think in a lot of matchups, he is kind of an auto win. There are a lot of top laners in this region that just cannot go head-to-head -head with a player like 369 and are going to lose if TES does invest a lot of attention into that top side, which we've seen this team be willing to do over the course of this season. He is very good on carries. He's very good on tanks. It honestly doesn't really matter. He's so versatile that he offers so many options to TES because he can be the primary focal point in Tian loves playing through him on the top side of the map or if you want to play through someone else just put him on you know something weak side top put him on Aatrox and he'll be fine he'll be able to survive in the 1v1 he'll probably win it isolated because Tion's pulling attention away and it's going to be generally good and then also of course the bot lane I think you can make a strong argument this is the second best bot lane in the LPL right now only behind Elkanon who we just talked about as the number one seed Mako of course being my first team all pro support and it's not like Jackie Love is some sort of you know pushover in the bot lane just because he didn't get an all pro nod because I think Mako did more of the heavy lifting over the course of this split doesn't mean I think he's a bad player in any stretch. He's a top three to four AD carry in terms of talent in the league. He was my MVP last summer and you know, just because he has less of a role, I would say overall on TES doesn't mean he can't still step up and fill a dominant position for them. He's another player that I think has historically played better in important situations. I know he gets this reputation of potentially throwing away game-winning situations or not exactly being fantastic when the entire team relies on him. But honestly, I don't really know where that reputation comes from. Maybe from the fact that TES hasn't exactly done anything in the last couple of years in terms of their expectations. They've always been a pretty highly prioritized team and they've never really been able to match that. But Jackie Love's one world 
Worlds for a reason. When you go back and look at those Worlds runs, you know, 2018, I think, was a great showcase. I think even 2021 was a pretty good showcase of what Jackie Love could do if, you know, you really give him resources, if you really lock in and try to play for him. He's still going to be a player I'm not worried about. Yeah, maybe his positioning isn't going to be perfect, but honestly, he really hasn't had a lot of bad games over the past year or so. He's just kind of been a very good AD carry, and he's more willing to take a back seat now, and I think that's even bigger for the team. But Mako is kind of the playmaker, the star for this team in terms of the flash he plays that they're going to be making. He's just everywhere on the map. His laning has gotten intensely good, and I think generally when you're looking at why he had such a down year last year for EDG, I chalk it all up to fit. I don't think him and Uzi ever really got like connected as a duo. It never really felt like they were on the same page in the same way that Mako has been for almost every other AD carry that he's ever played with. This is the best support in the history of the LPL. I'm very confidently willing to say that. I don't think there's anybody with Mako's resume or talent level. I don't know, maybe Ming? It's really the only one I think you could even make a, an argument for. Like, there are some, obviously, over the history of the LPL that people would like to make arguments for, but Mako's longevity and his, his Worlds Championship, I think, is pretty clearly a, a plus for me, and so I'm not worried about him. Him and Jackie Love are going to be fine, and they're going to be strong. I think if you are looking for reasons to be at least a little bit concerned, I love Tian, but he's not always the most consistent jungler in the entire world, and unlike what we've talked about with some of the other players so far, he has not always been the most consistent in big, pivotal moments. He's not always been huge in the playoffs. He's not always been huge at Worlds. And so maybe you're looking at a situation where Tian ends up going up against a, a Kanavi or a Shun, and it's not quite as successful for him. I think that could definitely be a possibility. And, you know, I'm not saying that that is going to be a definite because I think Tian has also shown in multiple different situations that he can be an important piece on a winning team. You just don't know that you're getting it 100%. But if he gives you what he gave you in the regular season, you're going to be very happy about that. And then there's Cream. Cream is kind of the big unknown for this team because he really wasn't given a lot of resources over the course of this year, but he was very productive with the resources that he did get. This is really his first big opportunity. I know people are going to say that he got top four last year on OMG, and I, yeah, he did. He got top four last year on OMG, but that team was performing way above expectation. Nobody really expected them to be in that position, and so when they got there, there really wasn't this responsibility like there is going to be on top esports. If he can live up to the expectation here and, you know, these big series against teams like JDG that they're probably going to have to face in this playoff run, then that's going to be very important. He can take over games. He He's an assassin-minded player, but, you know, he's shown very good proficiency on Karma and on Huey and on champions like that over the course of this year. So, you know, TES in the regular season didn't have a lot of flaws. If you're looking for potential areas to attack, I think Cream in the mid lane could potentially be an area because I don't think he's the perfect kind of stabilizing player in the mid lane. He's not immune to pressure if you are going to invest into that. And doing your absolute best to get Tion behind in a lot of these games, I think those are the avenues that you need to attack. If you can, you know, beat jungle mid, if you can actually establish pressure through the middle of the the map and translate that elsewhere. I actually do think you could have the potential to just beat top esports even as a less talented team, and that applies to a lot of different teams here in the playoffs, but that's way easier said than done, and that's assuming that top and bot don't just run over every team that they go into. This is still going to be the scariest team, or one of the scariest teams, I should say, in the entirety of the playoffs, even if they're not quite on the same level as BLG, in my opinion. And then moving on now to the number three seed. This is, of course, the next tier down when it comes to the LPL playoffs. Each team is sorted within groups of two, and so no team from this point onwards has immediately qualified for the double elimination stage. You need to earn it once you are in this part, but you only got to win one if you are a three or four seed, which brings us to our number three seeded, the 13-3 and three JD Gaming. And I think a lot of people are kind of surprised to see this team come in as the number three seed. They really aren't far off. They're only the three seed because of game score. They have the same record as top esports. They just didn't win as many games or as many series as cleanly in 2-0s as Top Esports was able to do. So they fall down to the 3 seed, but this is still a very, very good team. You have to give a lot of credit to at least a couple of the individual players on this team that have really stepped up and put in some heavy work for them and have really made them relevant, but there is a big difference between what this team was last year and this year. I think a lot of people thought that taking Knight out, putting Yigao in, it was going to be seamless, and honestly, I thought, you know, I'm really not super concerned about that if I was a JDG fan. I was, I told people in the offseason, don't be worried. Knight's a better player, but Yigao might actually fit better because he allows Kanavi to play more aggressive, and while Kanavi was excellent, and I think Yigao was definitely a big part of that, there are definitely 
significantly more concerns when it comes to this team this year than there were last year. And we'll talk about that. And that comes through in the stats as well, as you can probably see. But let's go ahead and talk about it. Their lineup is looking like, I believe it's going to be Sheer in the top lane. He's been playing most of the second half of the split here. Flandre is still there. He's still contracted, but it feels like Sheer is going to be starting. Kanavi in the jungle. Yagao in the mid lane. Ruler at 80 carry and missing at support. Of course, three of the five members that went to the World Semifinals last year that won almost everything before going to Worlds last year. The LPL, MSI. You know, a lot of these players are very experienced and Kanavi was the runner-up to my MVP. He has to be considered the biggest positive that this team has right now. There's been a lot of inconsistency, certainly not a lot of, you know, favorable outcomes in terms of maybe what you would expect from JD across this year so far, but Kanavi has been the constant. He has been the consistent. Whether or not you want to say that Yagao coming in has really helped that, because Yagao was a big reason why Kanavi was able to re-break out in 2022 in the first place, or if you just want to say that Kanavi's really good because he was also this good last year, it's really up to your interpretation. At the end of the day, all I can really say is Kanavi is the best jungler in the world. I don't even think that's really all that disputable for me. There are other good junglers, really good junglers. Canyon is playing out of his mind this year. I think he's really the other player that you would put in that category for me. Maybe someone like Peanut, you know, I think Peanut's also a very solid player that does a lot right, but Kanavi is just kind of a game breaker in a way that I don't think any other jungler is on a consistent basis in the way that Kanavi has been the last three years in a row. He really is exceptional and he does it his own way. He is the best early game jungler in the entire world, which is what I talked about earlier in the all pro segment. He is so adept at being able to generate his own leads and really he's not bad for the late game. He's just very good in the early game and that's why you're often going to see this team prioritizing a objectives and skirmishes around 10 minutes because they do want to try and play around Kanavi. That's definitely been the focal point for what JDG wants to do this year. The problem is that honestly, they don't have nearly as much lane prio as a lot of the other teams around them in the standings. That should change theoretically going into playoffs because these players are really good, but we haven't seen it. Ruler and Missing are probably the next best lane that this team has in terms of what they've shown in the regular season. They're very good. Obviously, you know, you don't need me to convince you that Ruler and Missing are two of the best players in their roles in the world. However, if you're just going off of 2023, that's just not the version of the spot lane that we've gotten this year. They've been very good, but very good is honestly a bit of a disappointment for Ruler and Missing in terms of how they have played, you know, the last year or so as a duo. They have been the best players in their position in the entire world. Ruler was a top three player at worst last year in the entire world. Missing was probably the best support player in the entire world last year, and both of them, I think, have taken some steps back. Ruler is just mispositioning himself a bit more than he really has at any point in his career. I don't know if it's just overconfidence. I don't know if situations are a bit different because mid doesn't have nearly as much prio, and so you're getting caught out in places where you're just being over eager with your roams. Maybe it's just readjusting to the style. I don't know what it is, but Ruler is definitely getting caught out a bit more. Outside of that, there really hasn't been any major problems. As long as he's not making those weird mid-game mistakes that he's made sometimes across this year, then he's still the player that we think he is. He's still the best skirmisher in the entire world, and he's still the best at taking a 1k gold lead and turning it into an 8k gold lead. You just need to clean up on some of the bad plays that are happening. And then for missing, he's not been this big game breaker really in any way, shape, or form. He's definitely been more of an accessory to Ruler over the course of this year, whereas I think last year, you know, obviously as a playmaker, he would he was huge, and he can still be that on Rakan. It's just not really been there on other champions, and I think teams have really realized that they can take away the Rakan from JDG and actually really hurt missing's performance. Do I think that that's going to carry on into the playoffs? Honestly, I would bet no, because because he was really good on things like Nautilus last year. They were really high priority picks for this team for a reason. And, you know, he is very effective in those matchups. It just hasn't necessarily been the case in 2024. Again, I would expect that to readjust back to the norm, back to the mean. I think his performances will go up. But strictly for going off the regular season, this was not a top two bot lane in the LEC, which is a bit concerning. And then the actual concerns are probably going to be the solo lanes. Yagao is here and Yagao's not exactly been great this year. I think one of the big benefits to Yagao as a player and one of the reasons he's always been such an asset to the teams that he's played for is because he constantly is able to generate prio in his own lane, whether or not he's actually winning the lane phase. He often is able to play things like Talia and Ari and be able to move around the map, be able to force the opposition to play a more macro-oriented style, which he's just straight up better at than everybody else. Like, he's a macro-oriented mid laner. He's somebody who's going to try to beat you by moving around, and, you know, that's fine. You can definitely still see the remnants of that by getting Kanavi ahead in a lot of these games. However, it's not come quite as easily for him because the prio hasn't come quite as 
as easily for him. Chalk it up to potentially mid lane just being better in the LPL now than it was, you know, for the last couple of years, or deeper at least, than it was the last couple of years, but Yagao has just not been the same kind of game takeover player that he was certainly in 2022, the last time he played with Kanavi, where he was arguably a top 10 player in the world, and then even last year, where I think obviously he struggled a bit more in spring, really found his footing in summer. This feels more like a regression to what he was in spring of last year, where he's just kind of fine for this team. I, again, he could potentially go back to the mean. This is a player who is playing below expectation and below previous career norms right now, and so you're really looking at a potential reopening up of this offense through Yigal if he can get a lot of the priority in the mid lane. However, him, Ruler, Missing, all of them have to play better than they did in the regular season if this team wants to be the best. Again, I think even at their worst, this is like a top three-ish team in the league. Like, 13-3 and three is the record they got when these players were playing inconsistently. I'm not trying to pretend like this team is going to be a one-and-done type of team that's not going to win a game in the playoffs or anything like that. But the, that's not the expectation. Like, JDG fans and JDG ownership in this team, I'm sure, expects themselves to win the LPL. And if you want to win the LPL, you got to get more consistent. But the upside is there because look at Sheer in the top lane. I actually think this is a really smart decision to bring him in. I think he gives you more upside than someone like Flandre does in the top lane, if only because of the way that Flandre plays. He's always going to be a bit more feast or famine. He's going to take risks that he doesn't need to take. Sheer is just as mechanically talented, if not more so. Clearly, they had some expert scouting on him in solo queue because they brought him in, and he has proven to be amazing. Basically, immediately, he went up in that series against Top Esports, played against 369, and just dominated him in the 1v1 in the top lane. Kanavi did help a bit, but still, like, Sheer winning that top lane matchup is ridiculous. Ridiculous, and maybe he's not been perfect, but he's really on the trajectory to be a game breaker for JDG. If that explosion happens as early as the playoffs, this split, then JDG is going to hit that upside. But really, to me, this team is centered around Kanavi and whether or not Ruler and Missing can get more consistent. If those two things can happen, they can win the LPL. That's the upside, clearly, for a team like this. But I do think that, you know, the entire team coming together is going to be a little bit of a question mark. And I certainly don't think they're nearly as much of a shoe in this year as they were last year. And then moving on now to the number four seed, and this is a team that I don't think a lot of people thought would even make the playoffs, let alone be a top four seed going into them. They have over exceeded expectations already by being here. Anything I think they get from this point onwards is house money, but they have the potential to make some real impacts in the playoffs here. Some real, do some real damage, if you will, in the playoffs here. It's the 11 and five fun plus Phoenix coming in as the number four seed. And again, this was a team that I think a lot of people, me included, had power ranked in their bottom four coming into the year. A lot of people did not see this team as particularly strong, especially because there were so many unknowns, but those unknowns turned out to be pretty darn good. Milky Way coming in in the jungle has obviously been a revelation for FPX, this jungle situation that nobody really knew whether it would be a positive or a negative. Yeah, it's turn out, turning out to be a pretty big positive for FPX with an MVP caliber player there. And then this bot lane, I think, has been significantly better than people thought it would be. I was high on this bot lane going into the year, if only because, you know, I'm not going to try to write off two players that have been good in the past because they played poorly in 2023 under weird circumstances. I certainly do think that both of these players have enough talent to be able to be big impacts. And you know what? They were pretty darn good this year, especially in comparison to expectation and especially in comparison to a lot of other LPL bot lanes that really let their teams down, which we'll obviously talk about. But let's go over the lineup as a whole and then we can get into some of the nitty gritty details. Their lineup is of course looking like Zhao Laohu in the top lane, Milky Way in the jungle, Care in the mid lane, Deck Dem at carry and Life at support. Very interesting stuff. We'll start with the players that I've already brought up. Of course, Milky Way is going to be the first conversation here. This is the fourth time I'm talking about him in this video. Talked about him in the MVP segment, the Rookie of the Split segment, the All-Pro segment. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Ridiculously aggressive in terms of the way that he wants to play the game. Definitely more of a carry-oriented player. Will really only play, you know, aggressive, skirmishing-oriented picks. Things like Lee Sin, Zin Zhao, if you want to be more of a facilitator, quote-unquote. And then Kindred and Graves, if he is trying to carry... In terms of the damage, it very much reminds me of Bo, if people are familiar with the LEC, or old LPL, like old FPX. Like, Bo is a very a, a very good comp, I would say, for how Milky Way likes to play the game. Can often be a really big asset because of his mechanical skill, but there are going to be times where he just lets his team down because his decision-making hasn't exactly evolved into being elite alongside his mechanics just yet. I still think he can be a major factor at this level and in the playoffs and in these major series, but there is a chance that I think his skill could diminish a bit once you get into a best of five, once you start getting into these longer series 
series where teams have more time and opportunity to prepare for you. He is a player that could potentially be targeted a bit more on some of his weaknesses. He's certainly not perfect in terms of his pathing. He's just been able to outskill and outplay a lot of the people that he's playing into. That's not going to go away by any means in the playoffs, but there are going to be opportunities to end up beating him that I don't think a lot of teams had as much time to take in the regular season. But he's not the only good player on this team. If he was, I don't think I would be excited about them at all going into the best of stage. I actually feel like I'd be pretty confident in them not doing very well in the playoffs. But this team does have more to offer in that sense. I think bot lane is a lot better than people have been saying it is. Life obviously got on my all pro team and he's been a big, you know, positive, I would say, for this team overall. It very much feels like Gen G life rather than Hanwha life from last year, and I think that's definitely a positive. The ability to go and play something really aggressive, really make Rumble support kind of his signature pick across this year has been really fun. I imagine it will be pretty consistently banned out, though, against FPX. I, as a coach, would certainly not let it through a single game if I was playing against this team in a best of five, so force him onto things like Maokai, force him onto Nautilus. The problem is he's still really good at those champions. Maybe not the same in terms of like game-breaking ability. When he gets Rumble they just win the game. It really is that simple, but he's still very good on those other tankier picks. He just wants something that he can be a big team fight presence on because his team fighting is so good. He's a decent laner, but really he wants to get out and he wants to try and make plays with the team rather than individually in the 2v2. And I think Dectum does kind of share that style. He's always been a bit slower as an AD carry, which I do think gives people the impression that he's not very good because people look at bot lane stats very heavily, especially in comparison to other roles. When you see CSD for bot laners, oftentimes that's going to let a lot of people know how you should quote unquote feel about an AD carry but the reason I'm so high on Dectum all the time is because I do think he's so consistent as a late game hyper carry when you put him on things like a Felios which was a signature pick for a long time or the Senna now that I think this team does like to go to a lot more you can rely on him to be very relevant in every single game and honestly he doesn't lose he's really good at staying even in laning phase even though it's not necessarily his strength and so yeah maybe this bot lane isn't going to be able to compete with the top three bot lanes in terms of skill I wouldn't expect them to be able to but I do think they have enough going for them to at least stay relevant in those matchups and allow the other players on this team the opportunity to win games. Life has won games for this team, especially when he gets that rumble. And Milky Way obviously has won a ton. It's really going to be about the solo laners. When you're looking at whether or not FPX is actually going to live up to this seeding, the solo laners have to be good enough. And that's really where I start to get a bit concerned when it comes to FPX, because I really have not been impressed with either of these two across this year. Care has definitely gotten the better track record over the course of his career was really good last year. Maybe not a star, but was certainly solid, and I thought he was great in 2022. The concern is that that trajectory isn't exactly ideal. Really, really good in 2022. Pretty good in 2023. Not so good in 2024. That's a downward slope, and that's not what you're looking to see. I think if you're looking on the flip side in terms of that, he has been better in the last couple of weeks. I think they've invested more into him as a carry, and that's definitely positive. It's all really going to depend on whether or not this team wants to invest a lot of resources into him. I feel like if he is getting resources, he is typically good in those games, but he has been a liability in a lot of games where he does have to play a more facilitative role, and I think that could be a bit of a problem for FPX because you don't want to take resources away from Milky Way. You don't really want to take resources away from life, and so that's certainly something to look at, but Zhao Lahu is definitely a concern. This is a player who actually had the best year of his career last year, and that being said, I'm still not particularly high on him. He was a player who had always underperformed expectations. Everybody was talking about him as this big prospect. This organization had invested so many resources into trying to make him a star in the top lane, and it just was never working. He was always one of the worst top laners in the LPL, and that kind of turned last year. He really started to go on a roll towards the end of summer, where things started to get better, but it really has not translated into 2024. His laning stats are not good, and the eye test definitely backs that up, and he's just like a mediocre team fighter at best. Really, like, this is a team of Milky Way life and Dectum, like half of Dectum, where you're like, yeah, those are good playoff players. Milky Way's an MVP caliber player. Life's an all-pro caliber guy in terms of how he played, and Dectum's solid. Like, you can win with Dectum. You can be a top, you know, four to six team in the LPL with Dectum as an AD carry, and then two solo laners that deserve to be, like, on bottom tier teams in the league, which definitely makes this a much more interesting conversation to have. The disparity between their performances and their expected talent is pretty massive, but if they're able to play through their star in the jungle and their strong bot lane, I do think that they have a chance to be able to beat a lot of the mediocre teams. I do think this team has an upside and inherent ceiling, because I think if Milky Way can't outplay or outclass the player that they're playing into, the, the players that they're playing into, then it's going to be a lot more difficult, especially when teams have more time to prepare. But by that same flip token, Milky Way might be the most mechanically talented player in the LPL. And so any game can really be one where he takes over. This is always going to be his team, whether or not he's going to be able to drag them across the finish line. And I just don't know if that's going to happen this year in 2024 so early. 
But now moving on to that number five seed. And of course, this is another tier jump going from three and four to five and six. Three and four only need to win one series to get to the double elimination stage. Five, six need to win two. They need to really be on their A game in order to break through. But I truly do believe that both of these teams have enough talent and have the opportunity to be able to make that happen if things go right. Coming in at number five in terms of our seeding, it's the 10 and six ninjas in pajamas. I think for a lot of this split, they were a top four team in terms of how they performed. Of course, things didn't end up going their way towards the back half. They really weren't all that uh, aggressive in the back half of the split, but I think people could have expected that with the way that their schedule ended up turning out. A lot of their easy games were at the beginning. A lot of their hard games were at the end, and turns out you can win the easy ones and you can lose the hard ones, and you're probably the team that everybody kind of expected you to be all along, but we'll go ahead and talk about it. Their numbers are very weird. It is very hard to get a, gris a grip or a grasp on what this team is in terms of ideology, in terms of how they want to play the game, but we'll talk about it. Their lineup is, of course, looking like Sean G in the top lane, Aki in the jungle, Rookie in the mid lane, Fodic at AD carry, and Juo at support. Uh, Rookie is the only player coming in with an all pro nod, although Fodic came very close for me because I do think he was very good. We'll get to him in a second, but Rookie is the lifeblood, the heartbeat of this team. He is the one who generates all of the pressure. He is the one who is oftentimes being the centralizing focus for what this team wants to do in terms of how they run their aggressive plays. He's everything for them. He's their star, and it's Rookie. Of course, he should be their star. He's one of the greatest players in LP history. It's really nice to see him have such a nice bounce back split here in 2024 after again. Like I talked about earlier, he really wasn't all that great in 2023. He was just kind of a guy for top esports. And honestly, at worst, he kind of cost them a world's opportunity uh, because he really wasn't good for TES last year. But getting back in an org that he feels comfortable with, he has reemerged as one of the best mid laners in the entire region. He's been essential towards this team actively winning a lot of their games over the course of this split. And honestly, I really value his experience in the playoffs when it comes to whether or not to trust. Ninjas in pajamas. Rookie is certainly not a player that's going to shy away from a big opportunity. Oftentimes, Rookie will perform almost identically to his regular season performances in the playoffs, both for good and for bad. When he's playing well, he will play well in the playoffs. When he's playing poor, he will play poor in the playoffs. Lucky for them, he's on a really good streak right now. And I think a meta where he's able to shove and roam and be more of a macro threat actually does fit him really well, where it allows him to play a lot more for a specific carry. In this case, it's the bot laner in Fodic, who again is the second best player on this team, which I did not believe was going to be possible at the start of this year. I was so high on Shanji and Aki, and even I was higher on Juo. Like, I thought Fodic was going to be the player that held this team back, but it has absolutely not been the case. Fodic's been very good for them, and he's shown a lot of individual positives that I just don't think he's had in his career up until this point. People have talked about, oh, you know, Fodic was so good back in 2022. I didn't see it. Like, watching him play in 2022, he was gift-wrapped one of the easiest jobs in the entire league, and basically every single time he was asked to do anything more than the bare minimum, he couldn't do it. Look at the playoffs. Teams targeted him in the playoffs, took him completely out of the game, and were able to get so many leads off of him that it cost Victory 5 a world spot. I'm not saying it was entirely his fault, but it certainly was. You know, he was certainly a problem on that team. And then last year, you could definitely make the argument that he was one of the three to five least valuable players of any team in the LPL. Like, the dude was actively losing game after game after game for Ninjas in Pajamas with his bad positioning, his over-aggressiveness. Clearly, he drank the Kool-Aid a bit too much. I think getting Getting Rookie back has clearly helped a ton, but also I think he's just in a better headspace now in terms of how he approaches the game. He's not taking unnecessary risks, and he's also not just like absorbing, you know, what the rest of the team wants to give him. He's found a nice middle ground where he hadn't really had that in previous years. He had either been, either been too far in where he's doing too much or too far out where I don't think he's doing enough. Now it feels like he has figured out kind of where he wants to sit, and I think it really is working for him. His mechanics are still very good, and I think he's emerging as somebody that I think could be a very big asset to this team moving forward, but he is going to have to step up. Playoffs has been a bit of an albatross for Fodic over the course of his career. That's going to have to change if NIP wants to really make a run here. Of course, Juo is also relatively positive for this team. My opinion on him actually really hasn't changed all that much this year. I think some people are going to look at him more positively than they did, you know, last year, but I was actually pretty impressed with the individual plays that Juo was making in 2023. Wasn't a great player, wasn't a star by any means, but he wasn't a great player or a star this split either. I think he's kind of the definition of like a league average support right now, where he's fine. There's going to be some games where he plays well. There's going to be some games where he plays bad, but for the most part, he's not going to make or break your split. He's going to be fine. He's going to allow your best players to win and he's not going to detract from them, but he's also not going to be the one to course correct this team when things are going wrong. He's fine. He's just not a, a super exciting player to talk about, quite frankly. And then you have Shanji and Aki, 
very interesting conversation here, because if you would have asked me at the beginning of the year, I would have said, oh, Shanji and Aki is the weak link of a team. They're like top two in the league at absolute worst, because Shanji was a top three top laner for all of last year. Aki was a top three to five jungler for all of last year. Both of them were elite in their roles, but neither of them have taken the transition going from OMG over here to NIP very well. Both of them have, I think, struggled a lot more than you would have expected, specifically Shanji in the top lane, who obviously had bigger expectations. You know, Aki really was more of a surprise in terms terms of when he broke out last year and was so good for OMG, he was always kind of the odd man out. In terms of the upside on their young roster, it was always Shanji and Cream and Abel as these really big upside picks, and they brought PP God in last year as kind of the veteran stabilizing presence. Aki was supposed to be kind of just the facilitator for them, but he turned out to be really important for that team. It's just not carried over. Again, I don't think he's been bad. In fact, I think he's been better than people give him credit for, but I don't think he's been good. I think he's just been fine. I think he's been okay, and that's got to be better. This team wants to be better than OK, and I think they can be better than OK, but Aki's going to be a big part of that. And Shanji, a lot of this year, has not been OK. He's not been fine. He has been a negative for this team for a lot of this split, and that was certainly not something I saw coming. This feels like 2021 Shanji. People remember his rookie year, or maybe people don't. Like, he showed a lot of flashes, a lot of interesting moments, but man, the consistency was just not there. It was a big reason why it took me a while to get on the Shanji bandwagon was because he really wasn't all that consistent as a young player. He really had to grow into that role. It is a little bit worrisome that he is kind of reverting to some of those inconsistent tendencies. He's been a bit of a weak link for this team. He's not been a good laner, and when he loses, he loses hard, and so that's a concern, but Shanji's also the kind of player that can win any game instantly. This was a guy who was a unanimous top three top laner going into the league this year, and just because he hasn't performed like that so far doesn't mean it's not still there. If you're getting a good performance out of the top side of this map, out of Shanji and Aki, as long as Fodic doesn't, you know, shit the bed and revert to his, like, negative playoff ways that he's kind of been stricken with, over the course of the beginning of his career, this team absolutely could make top four or even do better than that. Top three, I think, is possible for this team if everything were to go right. I think they're a little bit of a ways away from that, but it's certainly not impossible. It certainly could happen. I don't know if I would project it, but I do think there is upside for ninjas in pajamas, and there is the potential for this team to actually shock a lot of people in the playoffs, I think. And that's going to bring us to our number six seed as we get our final team to not have a round one matchup. Same deal here as the number five seed in terms of the amount of series they need to win to get to that double elimination bracket, but obviously a very different narrative going in. The number six seed is, of course, the nine and seven LNG Esports. And when I tell you this team is very, very hard to kind of pin down, I mean that they are very hard to pin down in terms of how good they are or how bad they are. They've certainly made some changes over the second half of the split. How impactful those changes have been, it's honestly kind of difficult to tell because they've gone on this massive win streak, but they've also almost exclusively played bad teams or teams that are in flux right now. Teams like, you know, Rare Adam and Edward Gaming and Ultra Prime and, you know, WE this past week, who is, you know, on a losing streak right now. It's really hard to get an idea as to where this team is genuinely at in terms of talent because all of their games where they should have been playing against, you know, teams that are around their skill level, around number six, around number seven in the standings, they were early in the season when they clearly had, you know, problems, when they clearly had things they needed to figure out. So, I think playoffs are going to be very interesting for this team as a whole. They very much have evolved their playing style in a way that I do think has gotten better, but... You know, time will tell if that is enough to be able to take down teams that are in the upper echelon of the LPL. But let's talk about it. Their lineup is looking like Zika in the top lane, Weiwei in the jungle, Scout in the mid lane, Gala at 80 carry, and Hong at support. Hong is really the only change to the lineup that they've made in the middle of this split. Obviously, they started with Mark as their starting support, but it just didn't work out. Mark didn't create the kind of plays and generally just isn't the kind of player that Hong is. You can talk about how Mark is very aggressive and how his laning is probably a tad bit better in isolation than Hong's is, but in terms of how this team plays and prioritizes playmaking out of the bot lane, Hong is one of the best supports in the region for what they want to do, and his re-emergence and re-entrance into this team has instantly made them better. And so I'm not going to sit here and try and pretend like that wasn't a massive change, but I do think there is a narrative surrounding LNG that I just don't personally agree with. I've gone on some rants. I know not everybody watches the weekly reviews, but I will try to summarize those rants in this video here because I do think there are some interesting things to talk about. We'll start with that conversation. The narrative all year long has been a couple, a multi-parter, we'll say. It involves multiple players, but the crux, the main three, this, the central part of this is Weiwei versus Tar 
Tarzan and how that affects Scout and whether or not he's washed or not. Uh, I think this conversation has gotten entirely out of hand. I don't think any of the things that are being said on social media, at least regularly, are accurate by most of the community, and I will quickly explain why. First of all, at the beginning of the split, everybody was blaming Weiwei and saying that Scout was completely washed, that last year was a full outlier for him. Neither of these things are true. What I had said regularly on this channel is that this is clearly just a playstyle problem. Weiwei is not Tarzan, and I think that's affecting Scout in a way that doesn't necessarily get the best out of him. Scout is really not a player who wants to skirmish a ton in the early game. He's not trying to flip games with a lot of these high intensity fights that may not necessarily have a ton of build up to them. He's a lot more of a front to back team fighter that wants to scale into the late game with a 10 20 CS lead and, you know, get really nice fights around objectives. That's always been Scout's higher priority rather than this aggressive trading in the early game. Tarzan was great for that because as a facilitative, slower jungler, he could actually keep the game in check, you know, kind of give up a lot of his own resources, really kind of take the fall and especially take a lot of the heat for why the early games were a little bit more inconsistent and allow Scout to really do the things that he could do at a high level. I was a big defender of Tarzan last year, and I continue to be a big defender of Tarzan, who I think always got a bad rap. He is the prime example, in my opinion. Him and Karsa are the prime examples of LPL fans just choosing to scapegoat junglers rather than actually trying to figure out what the problem on a team is. And then Weiwei comes in, and people assume this is going to be this big upgrade because Weiwei went to World Finals last year. But when you watch the tape from Weibo last year. He was fine. I mean, average at best. There were games that he actively lost for Weibo, and I would say he lost more games than he won on his own, but he was generally okay. He certainly wasn't a problem, and going into the year, I had Weiwei and Tarzan with the exact same grade, but I think they are completely opposite players. We're talking about Scout playing better because he has this jungler who's willing to play slow, willing to give up resources, willing to let Scout be the main character towards the back half of these games. Weiwei's not that guy. Weiwei's the main character of a lot of the teams that he's played for. He's more aggressive as a jungler. He wants to try a lot of these crazy skirmishes, and it just didn't click. It's not because Weiwei's a bad player, it's not because Scout's a bad player, and it's not because Tarzan is infinitely better and just makes everybody better, right? It's a, it's a playstyle thing. It, it, one size does not fit all in League of Legends. It really does matter whether or not you synergize with your teammates, and Weiwei and Scout have struggled to synergize over the course of this split. The reason that I'm a little bit higher on them now, and the reason I still hate this narrative now that Weiwei is getting back into form that, oh, clearly it was the coaching staff and, you know, not Weiwei and, you know, replacing their coach changed everything. Obviously, that's not the case either. I think this team has just figured out a better strategy towards approaching the game to get Scout back involved, and it's caused Weiwei to really drop off in terms of his resources. Weiwei is really the one making major concessions now, playing a lot slower, but Scout feels a lot more comfortable, and his productivity has increased. Obviously, it's made this team better, but the conversation around whether or not, oh, Tarzan would have made this team instantly better, well, maybe, but that's only because of the familiarity. It's not because he's infinitely better than Weiwei, and, or oh, you know, the conversation around Tarzan coming in was stupid. It was clearly the coaching staff that was holding them back. I also think that that is a dumb argument. I just think the narrative surrounding LNG this year has been bad, and also, you know, all of this being said, they're going on a hot streak right now, and a lot of people are saying it was because of the coaching staff changes. It's because Hong has come in, and while I agree that Hong has made this team better, again, I have to reiterate, they've basically exclusively played the worst teams in the league over this winning streak, and yeah, they beaten teams like OMG and, and WE during this stretch. Actually, I don't think they beat OMG. They beat another playoff team, but I, I'm blanking on who it was. Maybe it was Invictus Gaming. They've not been able to beat genuinely good teams this year, even when they were at full strength. It's kind of been a bit of a problem for them, and so that's going to be the concern. Scout is in form, but it's been against bad midlaners. Can he keep that up, and can this team keep up the play style against better teams? Gala has been excellent, and him and Hong are the two that I feel the most confident about. I really think if you give them a full split together again like you did last year, especially building upon what they had last year, they probably could have been in the same conversation as those top three bot lanes, as, you know, the, the upper echelon bot lanes that we've talked about across this video, but Weiwei I don't think is going to be a big difference maker for this team, mostly because either he is taking a lot of the resources and Scout has to make major concessions and the team plays worse because of that, or Weiwei is taking major concessions and he's just not going to individually look as good. Obviously, the latter is preferable because it causes the team to win more, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Weiwei often is going to default to his style in, you know, rougher situations, and Zika's fine on the top side. He's a really solid weak side top laner who's going to give you a lot of advantages, but isn't a star. 
star. He's not Ben. He's not 369. He's not the kind of player who's going to dominate lane like that. It's going to be up to whether or not Scout can keep rolling. I think this bot lane's going to be very good, good enough to go up against anybody that they face. And, you know, I think jungle and topside are going to be relative non-factors. If Scout can step up and really play like he had been the past month, this team's going to win a lot of their series. And if he doesn't, they're probably going to lose a lot of their series. It's really going to be about whether or not these changes are going to stick once LNG actually starts to get tested. They really haven't been in this new iteration of this team, quote unquote, new iteration of this team. And I'm very interested to see which direction they end up going in. But now that we are done with the teams that do have a bye in round number one, it's time to move on to our round one matchups. The final four teams that we talk about are going to be in the context of who they are facing in the first round. Because once again, to reiterate, it doesn't matter how good you are in comparison to the rest of the LPL. If you can't get past your round one matchup, none of that matters. So let's go ahead and go over it. The first round one matchup that we have is maybe the more interesting one, in my opinion. And that is reflected well in the seeding here as it's our 8-9 matchup between the number 8 seeded OMG and the number 9 seeded Team WE. A pretty historic matchup when you think about it here in the LPL, two of the more historic franchises in the history of Chinese League of Legends. And for them to face off in the round one here of the LPL playoffs, it certainly creates some interesting storylines because I think these two teams are both kind of sitting in very interesting spots. Now, I do find it very interesting that every single 8-8 eight and eight team is number 7 through 10, which means that every team that is playing playing in round one has the same record. There really is no advantage in terms of, you know, how these teams came out of the regular season other than game score, other than who was able to get to eight and eight more efficiently. But these two teams are very interesting in terms of how they match up against each other. Quickly to talk about what you're seeing on the screen, though, I should go over kind of the format. Of course, teams uh, on the top and the bottom, you can see the players. Any sort of stars indicate that, you know, I'm not entirely certain that they're playing, but I assume they are going to be playing, and there's been announcements that they're going to be playing, whether or not they play the whole series. I think it's up to them. Of course, they're most played champions over the course of this split with their win rates on it. And you can see the uh, numbers in the middle, 2-0, at least in this case, favored in WE. Uh, that just shows how they played against each other in the regular season. Of course, they played one series. WE won it 2-0 in the regular season. You'll also notice that the colors, the background colors for the two teams are not exactly even in the center. Think of this as a sort of percentile graph, if you will, a percentile bar, kind of showing my confidence factor, a confidence bar, if you will. Uh, WE in this case goes a little bit over OMG because I, spoiler alert, think WE is a little bit more favored in this. We'll talk about that as we go along, but let's go over the rosters that these two teams have. For OMG, it's going to be in the top lane cube in the jungle Zhao Feng in the mid lane angel in the bot lane Abel and in, at support PP God uh, and I believe it's going to be Abel I, I at least assume it's going to be him they have played him the last couple of weeks of the regular season over Starry and you know he definitely gives you more upside but he certainly you know we'll talk about why that might not be the most locked in decision and for WE their lineup is looking like wayward in the top lane hang in the jungle Fofo in the mid lane I believe it's going to be stay at AD carry and a Wandy at support I'm recording this about an hour or so before the series ends up kicking off and so we don't exactly know. We're not guaranteed to know who's going to be starting in the bot lane, but they did announce something on social media and Stay was in the starting lineup when it was announced. And so whether or not he ends up starting, he hasn't actually played in the last couple of weeks for WE. They've been giving Prince another shot, but I think Stay actually gives them more upside, which we'll talk about. But let's go lane by lane, talking about where I think each team has their advantages and their disadvantages. For top lane, I think this is pretty clearly in favor of WE. Not only do they put significantly more resources into this lane, like Wayward gets a lot of of the resources. He is the primary focal point for where WE likes to generate their advantages in the early game. He is probably the most resource intensive top laner in the league in terms of how the team plays around them. I can't think of another team, maybe even in the world, that plays around their top laner more than WE does. But even isolated, I think Wayward is a better player than Cube. You know, Wayward's not perfect. He certainly has his flaws and he's not nearly as good of a player on weak side, even though he's better than people give him credit for. But Cube is not good and he certainly has not been playing well this year. He was not playing well last year. It's been a little while since Cube has actually stepped up and been an important member of a team. You know, leaving Rare Adam, I think, really hurt Cube. And even in Rare Adam last year, he was not particularly good in the spring split. And so, you know, I think he's kind of on the downturn. Wayward has had the split of his career for sure in terms of just the amount of good games that he's had, even if I think he has been underrated the entirety of his career. And I think he should be the better top laner of these two in terms of raw mechanics. Now, if Cube shows up and starts playing like 2021 Cube again, good for him. Like, I'm happy for him. And, you know, that 
would be great for this team. I just wouldn't expect that to happen. I would say top lanes in favor of WE. You got Zhao Fang versus Hang in terms of the jungle matchup. Certainly an intriguing one because both of these players are very aggressive and both of them I would say are significantly better from ahead than they are from behind. Mostly because both of them are young. I think Hang though is significantly less consistent in that regard at generating those early game leads. I would honestly say that Zhao Fang is the better jungler out of these two. I know he's a rookie. I know he's not exactly proven this is his first ever playoff series at the LPL level and Hang did play here last year. However, Hang is playing significantly worse than he was last year going into this and I really don't trust him. Again, he's probably the single most volatile jungler in terms of if I get an early game lead before 10 minutes, I can snowball the game out of control or if I don't, I'm useless. Like I cannot play the game. I have no idea how to play team fights. It's really interesting to watch and it's why his win rates are so scattered on specific champions. I think Zhao Fang is certainly more consistent and someone I would trust more in these situations, which is why I'm giving him the edge here. And then you've got Angel versus Fofo. This is another very interesting conversation. The sad part is I don't actually think this lane is going to matter all that much, even though I think both of these players matter a lot towards their teams, because I think both of them are going to cancel each other out. I'm higher on Fofo and I'm higher on Angel, I think, than your average analyst. I do think Angel is a little bit better in terms of maybe individual execution. He's certainly better at being able to translate his leads and playing with more of an advantage. He's a resource carry from the mid lane where Fofo, almost the entirety of this year, has been more of a secondary player. They've really relied on him playing things like Huey and Karma more than a lot of other teams have because they play so much for topside and because they leave bot lane on an island like Fofo's moving around the map. This is much more of a macro role for WE than it is for OMG, which is why I don't think it's going to matter all that much. If Fofo is going to be moving around the map, I'm sure Angel will match, and it's all going to be about the skirmishes, and really it's going to be about jungle pressure in that situation. And if they stay in the mid lane, I doubt that either has enough of a significant gap on the other to really generate any sort of massive advantage. I think this is really going to be a push in the mid lane, maybe slightly favoring OMG. But bot lane is where things really start to get important, in my opinion. Able and Stay, or the bot lane matchup, whoever playing in the AD carry role. This to me is the matchup of the series. I think this will decide who ends up coming out on top because you're looking at Abel who has been a disappointment all split long. He went from being this super hyped up prospect that had a lot of seasoning to do at the beginning of his career in 2021 and in 2022 to really breaking out with OMG last year and you know being on a team that ends up making top four and really looking good with PP God being his mentor as his support to coming back this year with a lot of that top side gone, well, all of that top side gone and completely regressing, going back to even some of the worst tape that we saw from him in his rookie year. It's very concerning, and there really are reasons to believe that this is going to be continuing as a trend, and Stay, you know, to his credit on the other side of this matchup, has been the better bot laner for WE, even if I don't know if he's mechanically better than Prince. The style that WE likes to play is a Wandy not giving a single shit about laning phase. Sorry for the profanity, but we're an hour 20 in. I think it's fine. Um, and Wandy not caring at all about laning phase, and leaving his AD carry completely alone to 1v2 the entirety of the game and just running around on Bard and Rakan and Nautilus and doing something else. I think Awandi has hurt his team a lot because of it, but Prince is just not the kind of player who can play in that system. He's really not felt comfortable at any point. Stay, I think, is significantly better in that role, and I think he adapts to this team better as team fighting is a little bit more consistent, I would say, from a negative state. And so I do think going into this, he is a big reason why I value WE. I think if Prince was in this lineup, I actually think I would value OMG a bit more in this series, but I think Stay being in here just because of the pure, I guess, team composition. Like I said, it really matters how players on your team synergize together rather than, you know, what players are more individually skillful. I think Stay synergizes with this team better, even if I would trust Prince more on a different roster. And Wandi, I'm really not a fan of a Wandi. You know, I've always been a little bit lower on him, but it's always been a little bit timid on this channel in terms of me like saying, oh, I'm out on a Wandi or anything like that. But I'm starting to get to the point where I'm saying I'm out on a Wandi. I just don't think he's a player that I... Uh, whose style I think wins games for you. I think abandoning bot lane in this meta is just not a good idea. And the AD carries have really suffered. And this team has really suffered because of it. He has been miserable down the stretch and he's made really bad decisions. Maybe that ends up changing. I imagine he's still going to be highly prioritizing roams, but if Stay can survive, if you can get Hang and Wayward advantages on the top side of this map, that's been the recipe for success for WE. And that's how they won the first time for OMG. If you can win through the middle of the map, I honestly think it should actually be relatively easy to translate that to the rest. All Cube needs to do is survive, and I think Abel and PP God actually have the potential to pressure bot lane because of the way WE plays, even if I think they're a weaker bot lane, but Angel has the high potential to be the best player in this series, and if that's the case, if Angel and Zhao Feng come out and are generating a lot of that pressure in the early game, are really doing a good job of that, then I think OMG wins this series, and so I do think it's going to be relatively close, and you know, like I said, I think this is definitely going to be the closer of the two, but uh, there definitely is at least a small favorite in my mind. 
And then moving on to our second of the round one series, our final thing to cover here before we get to the full bracket prediction. Again, thank you guys for sticking around for this. I am very excited to go over it, but it is a pretty interesting matchup, at least in my eyes, between the number seven seeded Weibo Gaming and the number 10 seeded Invictus Gaming. This is definitely less, I would say, interesting than the 8-9 matchup, if only because I think one of these teams is significantly colder than the other. The only team coming into the playoffs with a below 500 game score is Invictus coming in as the number 10 seed, and they've earned that in recent weeks. They started off incredibly hot. Of course, they retained all five members from last year going into the beginning of this year. That has not carried over into the entirety of this split. They've got a new jungler, which was a positive for them for a majority of the time they were here in this split. You know, Leon coming in, I think only made this team better, uh, at least in the short term. In the long term, you know, Leon's always going to have his problems, but it seems now that You Should Know Me is also benched. He has not played in two weeks for this team, and I have Wen listed here as the starter, so we'll talk about that there. For Weibo, they've also tinkered around with their lineups, as you can denote from the asterisk there next to Zhao Hao. He has been in and out of the lineup, but it really feels like he is back in, and he has been really back in. I don't know if the benching woke him up mentally, but he has been playing the best league he's been playing all year over the past couple weeks. We'll get into it in just a second, but lineups, or at least projected lineups for both of these teams. For Weibo, it's going to be ZDZ in the top lane, Zhao Hao in the jungle, Zhao Hu in the mid lane, Light at ED Carry, and Crisp at support. And then for Invictus Gaming, it's going to be, I believe, Wen in the top lane, Leon in the jungle, Cryon in the mid lane, On at ED Carry, and Wink at support. Where do I think each team has an advantage? Where do I think they have a disadvantage? Well, let's go lane by lane and talk about it. In the top lane, again, I feel like this is actually just a push. I'm not going to say it's a push because I think ZDZ is definitely more talented than when. If You Should Know Me was here, I think there is significantly more upside for Invictus, but they clearly are fed up with the bad plays that he's making. They don't really want to put up with the good plays uh, if it's if it means that like two times out of three, you're getting the bad play. And so when has been put in for a theoretical higher floor that hasn't necessarily come to fruition just yet because he's still getting beat in the top lane, but I understand the idea of he actually does want to play tanks, and You Should Know Me just doesn't play them. Like, he has not played them at any point in his pro career. So, you want to play Cassante, you want to play Renekton, you gotta play Wen. And I understand that that can be a little frustrating, but that means ZDZ, ironically enough, one of the weaker top laners in the entire league and in the playoffs in general, is probably gonna be at an advantage in this matchup. He is fine. He's an okay top laner, a slightly below average top laner in my estimation, but Wen is just not an LPL caliber player, and so ZDZ should have an advantage. I don't think either are really going to matter all that much in this series. Top lane is the lane that I think will have the least impact on the series as a whole. Then you got Zhao Hao versus Leon. Very intriguing matchup because both of these junglers are moving in opposite directions and have had kind of opposite splits. Zhao Hao is obviously a channel darling, one of the biggest ones from his time on Anyone's Legend, where I've been hyping him up for essentially the last three years in a row on this channel. I've just been so high on Zhao Hao. He came over here to Weibo, finally got that big opportunity on a high-profile organization, and he's been okay. Uh, for most of the year, he wasn't doing particularly grand, but remember, Zhao Hao has always been a player that has played better in summer than he has in spring, kind of the opposite of Xiaohu in that regard, and, you know, I wasn't freaking out, I wasn't saying that he was going to be a disaster, but he did get benched at points in this split. I was very critical of that decision, not only because I believe in Xiao Hao, but because I think messing with the formula for Weibo at a time where they were honestly on the border of making playoffs was a very bad decision, a very risky one, that I do not think paid off. Maybe it paid off in the sense that Xiao Hao got woken up, and all of a sudden he realized he had to start locking in again, but in terms of their game score, they lost more games in that stretch than they really needed to, and that's the reason they are at 8-8 eight and eight was to me because they ended up making those jungle changes. At the end, they settled on putting Zhao Hao back in the lineup for the entirety of the rest of the split, and the flat, the final two weeks of the split were very Zhao Hao favored in terms of all of his matchups. He was excellent in the final two weeks, and so I imagine that's going to carry over. Leon is the opposite story. He was put in midway through the year for Tianjin, who just was not good enough for this team in the jungle despite what everybody wanted him to be, and Leon was an instant upgrade. This team was already doing well because of the synergy and the continuity they had from last year, but Leon took that to a new level with some early game aggressiveness and really any sort of proactivity out of the jungle role. The only problem is that he really doesn't have much else to offer. He is another one of those players, very similar to what we talked about with Hang, who's just not a good team fighter. Like, he is not good in that stage of the game, and so if he's not generating early leads, if he's not getting his laners ahead, he really doesn't have a lot of tools and 
I guess, resources in order to win games that go long. And that's going to be a bit of a problem in a best of five where teams can slow the pace down a little bit more consistently. So I think Zhao Hao definitely is favored in the jungle matchup here. I would expect him to be the better player. And then my matchup of the series, I think everybody's matchup of the series is going to go in the mid lane here. Two former teammates, two former solo lane teammates in Zhao Hu and Cryon. They obviously played on RNG together many years ago. They made worlds together. Um, Zhao Hu roll swapped to top lane to get Cryon a spot in RNG. So kind of a really fun matchup here I would say in the mid lane but it's definitely going to be interesting to see how it goes one of the things that I've definitely said about IG is that I think they've struggled a bit more since Azir got disabled I think the fact that Azir wasn't available for them actually hurt them a lot because when you look at the first couple of weeks Cryon was the centralizing force for what Invictus Gaming were doing the entirety of their late games they were playing around Cryon on Azir and allowing him to win a lot of those late games and it was a very efficient strategy for them and then Azir was disabled for like the second half of the year and all of a sudden Cryon it's not nearly as efficient. Now, can you just ban out Azir and get the same thing? Yes, and I think that that will definitely be a high priority thing for Weibo, but if Cryon does get the opportunity to potentially carry on that champion, then I think this matchup will be more interesting, but Xiaohu should be better. There really is no world in which Xiaohu should not be the better mid. He's been inconsistent as he has been the last couple of years. I think this year has been worse than the last couple of years in terms of that inconsistency. I'm usually pretty high on Xiaohu because I think his late games are elite. He's a phenomenal team fighter, even if his laning is at times not very good, uh, but I do think that just generally he should be more valuable as a player than Cryon. I think he does Cryon's role, but slightly better. We'll have to see though. Cryon was better at the beginning of the split, and so if you're getting that version, especially with Azir re-enabled, that could really open up some opportunities for IG. And then Light and Chris versus On and Wink. Again, I think these are two good bot lanes. Maybe not great. I think Light and Crisp are much closer to being great. They were great last year, but they've kind of just been good this year. I still think Crisp has been underrated. I continuously think that Crisp is underrated as a player. I think he's very valuable to Weibo. He was their most valuable player last year, in my opinion, and he's been good this year. Maybe not perfect. Has had a couple of games that will leave you scratching your head, but that's Weibo Gaming. That's just kind of the identity of the organization and this team in particular, so I'm not going to freak out about it, but Light is hyper-consistent, very very good in the late game. Crisp is a playmaker, can play multiple different styles. They're a very good bot lane, but On and Wink aren't pushovers either. They're a solid LPL bot lane, maybe slightly above average, but like average to slightly above average. Like that's where you're going to land. They're not going to be a problem. They're not going to be a weakness, but I don't think they're going to be a strength in the same way that I think Weibo's bot lane could be a strength. There are going to be circumstances in which I think On and Wink could actually be the better bot lane in this matchup if only, uh, you know, Leon and Cryon are able to get that early advantage. I think bot lane is going to benefit a lot from that, but I would not expect a lot of 2v2 advantages coming the way of IG. Neither would I on the side of Weibo, unless Crisp is playing super aggro and super well, which I do think is possible, but I just don't think it's going to happen here. Again, I think this matchup is going to be decided by the middle of the map, and whether or not Cryon can be a centralizing, generating force for IG with Leon carrying the early game, or if things end up just going a little bit more to plan when it comes for Weibo. As you can see from my percentile graph, I definitely have this in favor of Weibo. I think the negative run of form for Invictus right now is just not in their favor. Do I think they could win a game or two in this series? Absolutely, but I think Weibo should be the better team, and I think they would be disappointed, and it would be a bit of an upset if they went out in this series, and so uh, as you can see from the percentile graph, I definitely have my opinions, but I certainly don't think this is going to be the easiest series in the entire world for them. All right, but that is going to do it for my analysis of all 10 teams, whether it's just the regular analysis for the top six or the round one analysis for numbers uh, seven through 10. We have gone through all 10 teams in depth in terms of what I'm expecting from them. And now it's time for our full bracket prediction. This is always the most fun part of the video, going through my thoughts on everything in depth, who I think is going to be walking out as champion, who I think is going to be joining them at MSI. It's a lot of really interesting stuff, and I'm excited to talk about it. It. You know, we'll talk about the format first and foremost, of course, up on the screen. You can see the bracket. It's going to change. It's going to update. As we go through it, I am going to be announcing who I think will be winning each series as well as giving a series prediction score. So, you know, 3-1, to 3-2, to 3-0, etc., etc. I will also be giving a one-game... Uh, I guess you could call it a spread, a one game spread. So if I say, I think X team will win 3-1, but my spread is, you know, this team 3-2, that means I think it's closer to a 3-2 than it is to a 3-0. I think it's closer in that direction than it would be 
to going in the other direction. But my you know, predictive score is still my personal predictive score. Of course, these will change as we go throughout the playoffs, but this is my pre-playoff bracket prediction. So let's get right into it. We've got a lot of series to go over. Starting with OMG versus WE. Already covered this in the primer. You can already, you know, probably guess who I'm going with. I'm going with the team I had a higher confidence rating in, Team WE. I think they should be better in this series than a team in OMG. I think they are more complete as a roster than OMG, and I think they're going to have a trouble, or I think OMG is going to have trouble stopping the top side of the map because I just don't think they're built to do that in their current construction. I think WE should go over here. My prediction is WE 3-2. WE 3-1 is the spread, and so I think it's closer to being WE favored, but I do think it will be a 3-2. I think Angel and Xiao Feng are going to pull back a couple of games, but then on the bottom side, Weibo Gaming taking on Invictus. This one's way easier. Weibo Gaming is going to be going over in this one. Invictus has just looked completely lost in recent memory. They just don't feel like the team that they were at the beginning of the split, and I don't think anything's going to change. I think You Should Know Me probably comes in halfway through the series, and I don't think it reinvigorates IG enough. I think there are too many problems on this roster, and I think Weibo is too talented to fall here in round number one. My prediction's going to be Weibo 3-0. The spread's Weibo 3-1. I think this should be a 3-0 in favor of them. I think they are the better team, but if it was a 3-1, if IG pulled a game, I'm not going to be shocked, especially if You Should Know Me does come back in to the top lane, but then back up to the top side, WE now taking on Ninjas in Pajamas, a very interesting matchup on paper, in my opinion. I really like that these two have the chance to go head-to-head -head in the playoffs, but I'm going to go for Ninjas in Pajamas in this one. I think this will be a lot closer than people think it is, but I'm relatively high on both of these teams. I think NIP just has a little bit more firepower. I think Rookie will be the best player in the series, and I do think NIP is significantly better prepared to be able to stop some of the top lane plays that WE want to make, and also I think they're better prepared to be able to take advantage of the bot lane inconsistencies that WE has, and so NIP should be going over here. My prediction would be NIP 3-1, NIP 3-2. I think they're definitely the better team, but I think WE has the chance to pull back some games in this series. And then bottom side of round two, LNG now taking on Weibo Gaming. This, I'm going to be completely candid with you, the hardest series to pick in the entire bracket. I have these two teams with almost identical ratings. I really don't know who would win this. It really is a 50-50. I mean that in the most honest of ways. And so I'm going with the team that should be better in terms of talent, LNG Esports. Whether or not they're going to be or not, I think these two teams have shown almost identical things on tape over the course of this year. A lack of knowing a strong identity and inconsistent players, but Gala is really the one who pushes this over the edge. Of course, Scout is also going to be factored into my equations. I just think they're too talented to be a team that ends up going out. I think their hot streak is going to help them in terms of confidence, but Weibo could win this very easily, and I wouldn't really be all that surprised, especially if Zhao Hao and Zhao Hu are just the best players in the series. If Crisp can outplay Hong, which I definitely think is possible, then I think LNG could struggle, so... My prediction is LNG 3-2, Weibo Gaming 3-2. That's my one game spread there. Uh, I think this really is closer to a 50-50 than anything else. And like I said, this was the hardest series to predict in the entire bracket for me. It's the one I spent by far the most amount of time on trying to figure out stats and just matchup analysis. And trust me, it's, uh, it's a tough one, but I, I think LNG very, very narrowly. But back to the top side, the final series that we get before we get into the double elimination bracket. You got to win this to get into double elimination. It's the number four seeded FPX, number five seeded Ninjas in Pajamas. I've got ninjas in pajamas winning this. I know that's not going to be a super popular opinion. Maybe people are going to disagree with it, but I know people in their hearts want FPX to go on this deep run and really want them to be successful. I just don't think this is a team that's built to win best of fives. I think teams are going to target Milky Way super hard, not only in draft, but in game, and they're going to force anyone else on that team to beat them. And I'm just not sure there is anyone else. Life is really good, but Rumble's going to get banned out. Dectum isn't exactly this big hyper carry in the early game to stop teams from snowballing out of control. And I don't trust Yao Lao who or Care to be the best player on a team that's going to win a playoff game against a team like Ninjas in Pajamas with Rookie and with Fodic, who's playing really well, and Shanji and Aki, who have playoff experience, and, you know, Zhuo, to his credits, got playoff experience. I think NIP should be the better team out of these two in a big best of five. But again, if Milky Way is really good, maybe that changes. Uh, my spread here is NIP 3-1, uh, NIP 3-2. I think FPX could make things close, but I think NIP should be the better team here. And they're going to move on to the top four. And joining them will either be JD Gaming or LNG Esports. And just like last year, JD Gaming's just got their number. I think they're the better team out of these two by a pretty considerable margin. If you haven't noticed, there's a top three in the LPL right now, and I think that top three has become apparently clear. JDG, if they don't make the double elimination stage, is going to feel absolutely devastated. It will be a disaster for them, but I think they clearly have an advantage over LNG. I think they're good enough to pull back a game, but my spread's going to be JDG 3-1, JDG 3-0. I think it's closer to being entirely in favor to them than it is to being remotely close in terms of who's going to take the series. I just think LNG, you know, Gala in particular, is good enough to win a game for this team. I just don't think it'll matter in the grand scheme of things. I think it'll be a, a consolation game. 
But now we're in the double elimination. We're in the top four. Everybody's got two lives from this point onwards, so it's obviously more important to get to this point. Ninjas in Pajamas versus Billy Billy Gaming on the top of the bracket here is very interesting, but Billy Billy Gaming is clearly the better of these two teams. Ninjas in Pajamas, I think, has a very fortunate dra uh, bracket draw. They haven't pulled LNG, they haven't pulled Weibo Gaming, and they haven't pulled JD Gaming. They have gotten very lucky. They get to play FPX, WE, and OMG in the beginning parts of this bracket. That's probably the easiest run they could have gotten, considering how the standings went. And they're going to drop to the bottom side of the bracket because of it. BLG should have a very easy time in this series, I would predict. BLG 3-0, I guess BLG 3-1 would be my one game spread, but really my prediction is BLG 3-0. This should be an absolute stomp. They're clearly the better team out of these two in almost every single conceivable area. And then Top Esports and JD Gaming. This is the most interesting matchup that we're going to get in the top four, in my opinion. And maybe against the grain, I'm going Top Esports in this one. I know that's not going to be a very popular opinion, but I honestly think that TES is really built to do well in best of fives better than people give them credit for. I think they're actually very versatile in where they can put a lot of their resources. They haven't even really tapped into the Jackie Love well across this year so far. They've relied so much on Mako and 369 and Tion to be big playmakers. I think Cream has the potential to step up, but if Jackie can really lock into those playoff performances, I think TES overall is a more well-rounded team. But again, this is a great series. I think JDG is never going to go down without a fight. And especially if they are players who have been underperforming like Yagao and if you can get something good on the top side from Sheer, I think if those players step up, they could easily win this series. My score is TES 3-2, JD Gaming 3-2, but, you know, it's closer to a 50-50, but maybe shockingly I'm going with TES here. And then in the bottom bracket, the lower bracket now, our uh, bottom bracket, low losers bracket, that's the word I'm looking for. You have Ninjas in Pajamas and JD Gaming. Again, pretty easy here. I'm going JD Gaming. They should be the better of these two teams. Ninjas in Pajamas is fortunate to have gotten their draw. I think they will have an easier path than most to the top four, but I do not think they will make a huge impact once they get there. This should be a pretty clean series from JDG. In fact, my prediction would be JDG 3-0. JDG 3-1, again, like I said for BLG, is the one game spread, but really my prediction is JDG 3-0. I do not think Ninjas in Pajamas should be winning a game once they get to this point in the bracket, but they did get to this point in the bracket in terms of how I think it will go down, but the uh, same thing applies to FPX. If FPX gets here, I doubt they win a game, but top three really is just kind of like that for me, so they move on to the semifinals. Who's going to be joining them, and who will be making MSI? Well, our winner's finals is, of course, between Billy Billy and Top Esports, and I have Billy Billy winning this. I think they're the best team right now in the league. They're going to be going into winner's finals, and they should honestly pretty easily dispatch TES. TES has struggled to take down very aggressive teams that just have ridiculous mechanics, and that's what BLG is incarnate, right? They're June, they're Knight, they're Elk, they're On, Bin. Like, this is the mechanics team in the world right now, and TES is just not built to be able to beat that. I think this should be relatively easy for Billy Billy. My spread will be BLG 3-1. BLG 3-0. I think this is closer to a 3-0 than it is to a 3-2 in my opinion, in terms of how I would expect this to go. But that leads us into the semifinals, a rematch of TES and JD Gaming that we got earlier in the tournament, so we already know the result, right? No, I'm picking JD Gaming. Are you kidding me? Of course I'm predicting TES to get to winner's finals and then bottle a trip to MSI. What do you think I'm doing? I've watched the LPL before. I know how this is going to go. Yes, I, I did this more for the memes. I think these two teams are very close. You know, I do think JDG is going to go to MSI, and I do think they're better than top esports. Um, I just didn't want to have them win twice because I thought that would be less interesting in terms of my bracket prediction. So I do think JDG is the better team, and I think if either team is going to win twice, it's going to be JDG, but I really think that Top Esports has the potential to beat them in a series and then get obliterated by Billy Billy, lose all their confidence, and then not be able to keep up in the semifinals, and so uh, that's what I'm going to predict here. I'm going to predict JDG, JDG, JD Gaming to go to the finals by beating TES. 3-1 or 3-2 would be my spread for this particular scenario. Again, this is way closer to a 50-50 in terms of individual talent and how they match up against each other. I just think it would be really funny, and uh, this is the outcome I think would be the uh, most in line with how how these organizations have performed. So I have Billy Billy and JD Gaming going to MSI. Wow, two shocking teams that nobody saw coming. I think everybody's going to have at least something close to this, but these are the two best teams, in my opinion, in the region. There's really no reason to buck the trend when there's no need to. Um, one versus three in the finals, Billy Billy versus JD Gaming, and I'm not going to buck the trend again here. Billy Billy is my predicted champion. To me, they are clearly the best team in the LPL. Now, if there is a lot of confidence generated from JDG beating Ninjas in Pajamas, beating Top Esports, especially if both of those series are conclusive, like I would think they would be, then I think they could go into the finals and play some ridiculous League of Legends. If Ruler and Kanavi pop off, they're there is a high potential that those are just the two best players in the world, and they just end up winning that series based off of them alone. You have Missing and Yagao as accompaniment pieces, like, yeah, that's pretty darn good, but I would expect the completeness of the Billy Billy roster to be able to overcome JDG just like they were able to do in the regular season, but that's my prediction for the full bracket. A very, you know, I would say relatively in-depth breakdown. Let me know if you agree or disagree with any 
of my picks, of course, politely down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed the video, it really would mean a lot to me if you left a like on it. It really does help out the channel a ton. Let's me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. We don't only post about the LPL, although we are going to be posting about every single round of LPL action in the playoffs, uh, basically, you know, by daily, if you will. But we also post about the LCK playoffs. LEC playoffs are starting soon. They started today. You know, NA, NA LCS playoffs have been starting. You know, NACL playoffs have been rocking and rolling. We're basically at finals for them. This is a comprehensive overview channel. We're going over everything in Lolly Sports. And MSI is also just around the corner. So hit subscribe, hit that bell so you can be notified when all those videos I post go live. But with all that being said, I hope you all are having a great day. I hope you continue to have a great day. And I will see you all later.